welcome to a special episode of Beyond Barbarossa, the first English language podcast in the world to focus on the Eastern Front of World War II. Today is the first anniversary of this podcast. One year ago, on 22nd June 2022, the first episode came out with this description. Evening, June 22nd, 1941. In what is now Lithuania, cows, horses and sheep sleep or lazily crop grass. The neat farmhouses are dark. Crops sprout in the fields. As the day ends, if anyone's listening to radios in the cities, dance music plays. The longest day of the year leads, naturally, to the shortest night. At just past 3 a.m., the first glimmers of light appear on the eastern horizon, tinting faint orange and yellow. Far overhead, the drone of airplanes, bombers, pass toward the east. At precisely 3.05, the loudest thunder ever heard bursts the bucolic calm. Dawn becomes bright as midday for an instant, before it is swallowed by black smoke. In the words of one who was there, it is as if the jaws of hell have opened. The peaceful fields are torn apart by exploding bombs and shells. Airplanes scream lower to drop thousands of fragmentation explosives on unprepared defenders. This is the opening of Operation Barbarossa, the greatest land invasion in the history of humanity. I'm Scott Burry, podcasting to you today, as always, from the Red Beard Studio, located on a part of Algonquin Anishinaabe territory now called Ottawa, Canada. Today is the first anniversary of this podcast, as I said, and that's why I delayed the release of this episode, number 29, not counting the bonus episodes, delayed it just a few days from Monday to this, to coincide with the 83rd anniversary of the launch of Operation Barbarossa, the greatest land invasion in history, when Nazi Germany attacked its temporary ally, the Soviet Union. So in addition to being a double anniversary of that operation and this podcast's launch, what makes this episode special is my special guest. He's one of my favorite podcasters, one of those who inspired this podcast, a man who's visited the war front in Ukraine multiple times over the past 15 months and even rode a Ukrainian tank. The Righteous Regan, the one and only Kristaps Andersons podcaster of the Eastern Border. Welcome, Chris Stapps. Chris Stapps, please introduce yourself by telling everyone about your podcast and how you got started. I was in college doing my bachelor's in history a long time ago. I think it was 2013 or something. Oh, it's been 10 years already. Wow. And I was listening to podcasts, uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History specifically, which I found because some random person had put it in our college group's study uh, kind of web server with other stuff on it. And I discovered Dan Carlin, the Carlin show. And then, you know, I had a bunch of studies for my bachelor's thesis about how people served in the Soviet army. You know, all the studies, we, weird studies, weird anecdotes, basically. It, and, during the uh, Second World War or after? After, after that, I... I spoke with veterans too, but that was a bit, bit uh, that was a bit later. But oh. it all started with uh, the people, you know, my my parents' generation aged, I don't know, about fifty five to sixty five at this point. Yeah, because I'm I'm thirty three, and I, I had collected a lot of studies. So I had collected a lot of studies about this, and I just translated them into English and posted them on the Dan Carlin forums. And then Dan told me that I should make a podcast. And I did. And turns out uh, no one else was doing this at the time. Turns out I was the very first podcast in the Baltic States. And, oh. and then it kind of escalated from there. And well, I just take my job seriously. That's all that I do these days. But yeah, um, but yeah so, it started out because of this random chance that I, I was listening to Dan Carlin back in 2013. Yes. Was it originally called the Eastern Border? Yes. Yes, it was. The Eastern Border was there because... I thought about, you know, at, at that point, at that point, every podcast had to have a catchy name because we're talking about the era where YouTube was just starting to appear and grow big. And when podcasts were just popping out on, on the iTunes stage and everything, 
And I wanted to have something thematic for my show. At that point, remember, I was listening to Hardcore History, also right. a very kind of strong name, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to pick something meaningful. So Eastern Border came out because I view Latvia as an Eastern border of the European Union. That, that's my logo represents the fact that this is the border between the EU and, and, and Russia and that whole other post-Soviet thing, both physically and sort of metaphysically in a way, because mm -hmm. we, uh, we have been trying to you know, re restore our place among the Western nations, which we held in the interwar period, and that it was taken away from us. And now we're trying to build it back. So we're on this border between being post-Soviet and being Western. And again, it's both geographically and metaphysically. And also, it, it, it was nice that I started the podcast while I was living literally 20 kilometers from the Russian border as well. Wow. So I, it, it all just seemed to kind of fit and click into my mind. And there was... A long time ago, I remember there was some TV show, but that was about country music or something. I don't know. I don't remember. I remember just watching the show as a kid, and it was called Austrum Rua Beja, which is Eastern Border, but Latvian. Oh. And that that wasn't trademarked. And it just kind of, you know, when I was thinking about this name, I, I found the meaning. And then it just kind of struck me that I had seen this short-lived TV show about Latvian country music. It, it had like, I don't know, 10 episodes maybe or something. And, and then I just adapted that to English. And, huh. and yeah, that, that's that's why it is called the Eastern Border. Okay. And I also picked happiness is mandatory because I love that. It is. It is also again. I try to put some meaning into all of this. <laughs> Back in the day, you know, everything had to be quite meaningful. That's why I call all my listeners comrades, and why I have this well a bit improved currently, but like kitschy theme song, and I you know kind of play um pl play up the the kitsch elements of the Soviet era because it started out a bit you know a bit about. Soviet life because there is an there's a in Soviet Union they made a lot of good comedies a lot of good comedy movies and mm -hmm. there was one of these jokes which 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 went like what are you laughing about we're laughing about ourselves basically right. so this ability to laugh about yourself and and take these darker dark concepts and dark things and turn them into a way that is not exactly very depressing I, I think that's that's one of my strengths of my show I, I started out doing this as a as a means of keeping myself you know more or less sane because i'm i'm constantly talking about and even now with the war about personal tragedies that has that have happened to me and yes. things that have impacted me a lot and this this way is a, you know it, it all comes from the ashkenazi culture uh, from from the eastern european jews and they invented all the political jokes in the soviet union so this whole self depreciation and and uh, this gallows gallows comedy in a way it's not there to, to mock anything it's there to just you know to be able to look at these things with a somber uh, sober eye and and just keep you know keep your cool so to speak right, that, right. That, that, that's that's my that's my podcast and tagline and everything i hope this this uh, helps a bit so well, your podcast uh is about the eastern front or sorry the eastern border and my podcast is about the eastern front so we have uh, one word in common at least <laughs> Well, um, yeah, the Eastern Front went over our country very brutally and harshly. Right. Oh. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you about. Um, you know, we, we've we all heard how foundational or how formative the Great Patriotic War uh, is in today's Russian culture. How is it perceived, or is it still such a, bear such a, a big presence in current Latvian culture? Well, yes, it does. For example, oh, one of the elements that uh, was brought to the forefront was the Soviet Victory Monument that we demolished mm -hmm. last year because of the whole invasion thing. Because it turned away from being a monument for the war and against the Nazis, it was just as, it, it had become, since Putin's dishonorable and despicable actions, a temple of imperialism and chauvinism. I mean, what sort of a victory monument in World War II can you have if every year, uh, if every year Putin's supporters gather there and they wave Russian imperial flags next to Soviet flags? Mm. That makes no sense. It was at that point, it had become basically no longer about the, the, the whole victory thing, no longer about war, but about Russian imperialism. I, I personally sp spotted the fact that, you know, when they started the Immortal March back in 2008, uh, back then, mm. it, they truly carried the pictures of of their dead, uh, and, and I can respect that. 
even though we've suffered a lot from them, it's it was still a brutal war, and I understand very much the nuances of the whole situation there, and mm-hmm. I can respect that. But at one point, you know, uh, I, I believe that uh, it, it switched over from being a monument de- designated to Soviet victory to something completely else at the moment when they no longer started carrying their own family pictures. They just started throwing them out at the end of their walk. That was mm. bad. But it got it got demolished because of the whole, you know, because of the war and the actions that the Russians undertook against Ukraine. And it was seen as a major event here. Because mm. again, this, this monument, it was built in 1985 to kind of commemorate the 40th anniversary of the end of the war, World right. War II. And... Um, and yeah, it had been there because for us in the Baltics, there goes right victory there. victory in the war for the Soviets did not really mean anything that good. No, and everyone everyone really everyone really uh, suffered from from all this. For us, it meant loss of our freedoms, loss of our sovereignty, loss of our identity as as people. Well, attempted loss. We managed to keep it somehow, but. It was something that for, for us, the, the 8th of May, the end of the war in Europe, is a memorial date because a lot of people have died from, okay. from everywhere. And and it was kind of weird to see how these pro-Putin people turned it into a massive celebration. And, and, and you know, uh, they, when I was growing up, my grandmother told me always that everyone, you know, my grandmother's all, grandfathers also were participants of the war. And um, they always drank at the date and said you know let's just have this never again let, let, right. you know let's never repeat this and then and then at one point again it all shifted to Mozhan Pavtarit you know we can repeat this and it oh, just twisted. We, we can have another victory yeah that, that's the Russian thing that they're doing now with all this stuff we oh. can go to Moscow once again and yeah that, that's how it's all shifted but again uh, I, I'm telling you this story because this whole aspect of what the war meant what it was and, and everything that happened in it with our country and with the Soviet Union that's that's remained central to this day I suppose and to an extent that I would even call that we should probably move on from it a bit it's, it's, less, it's, a, it's a less massive scar in our society hmm. because um, and we'll get to get to on this uh, I, I suppose in, in the further questions but it, it truly decimated our demographics completely like our economy and it was just, just pretty horrible hmm. <laughs> Like truly, one of the most horrific things that could happen, and I, I cannot overstate the impact uh, of World War II and its end, and what happened in, during this whole fighting that 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 was here, because we mm-hmm. are the borderlands, bloodlands. If you if you like Timothy Snyder's version of the whole story, but um, but it is true. It is yeah. true. Yeah. It is it is it is something that you know. It speaks. It speaks a lot when basically the whole war, World War II, and its effects changed the, changed our national culture quite a lot. It changed wow. how people view themselves, how they view Western world, how they view everything. Like, because I've studied interwar period and, and stuff before that, and and it was a kind of a cultural shift, so to speak. It, it truly was something so horrific that uh, that it changed. A lot about how people view the world here in Latvia. We used to view, for example, the Russians as our natural allies. Right. All the way before that, we we didn't have much hatred towards them, even when the revolution broke out in 19, uh, 1917. We, we didn't like the Germans much more. Mm. Uh, Germans and 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 the British too, by the way. But um, but now that that shifted because of all, of all the weird things. And right. and yeah, it's left a tremendous scar. I'm just you know explaining a bit more because I, I believe it's important to bring some context and some personal personal message into this whole this situation because you know you can write you, you can read in many books about how this was important and a crucial event, but to truly understand what it means, you kind of have to put yourself in the shoes of the people who lived through it, and you have to have some understanding on well, uh, on some empathic level to it, understand it, the, the trauma, I, I think, at least. In Ukraine in 1941, on the invasion uh, of Operation Barbarossa, um, it has become kind of a trope that um, it, a lot of Ukrainian people initially welcomed the German invaders as liberators from communism and Stalin. Did a similar thing happen in Latvia? Exactly the same thing. Exactly. Okay. 
is because 1940 is known in our culture as the horrid year. The, 19, the, yeah, when when the Soviet Union ended. when the Soviet Union came in, yes, because yeah. of 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 all of the murders and and exiles and and being sent to Siberian gulags and everything. And at that point, yeah, well, not like Hitler advertised his his plans on everything. Yeah. He treated us quite nicely. So yeah, we truly did greet him as a liberator because what Stalin did to us was so horrid that people just you know those who had survived and <laughs> they volunteered. And droves to go and fight Bolshevism because mm. not like we had a choice. I mean, at that point, there were no allies even near us in any position. No. So mm. these people, a lot of them volunteered, and and their tragedies also is one of the things that forms whole all, all my nation. Because imagine this: Stalin comes in and shoots, uh, destroys, kills, and murders a lot of your family members. Your mm. family members are all dead and, and you're happy to survive and then hitler comes in and says well of course we're going to restore independent latvia he he obviously lies there because he wanted to turn us into a servant servant race basically but um you know people just were grasping at some stroke to you know fight against bolshevism and then they go to the front lines and they find out find out found, find out mm, sorry and then they find out that um yeah their friends now are being murdered by the same guy who promised liberty right it, yeah. and, and then they come back, those who survived after the war in 1949, and then there's a second wave of persecutions by Stalin. Ah, right. It's just, it's a massive tragedy because we lost about, we lost approximately, in Latvia at least, we lost 40% of our male population. Wow. In those and eight years. It, during World War II, yes. Okay. And, 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 well, from both wow. sides together, from, from both Stalin's side and Hitler and Hitler's side, like we lost so many, so many people, which is why we still have demographical issues because it, you know, it leaves a scar, it leaves a mark. Right. Uh, it was just horrid because so many people died or emigrated that we, we still haven't gotten over it in the demographical sense, same as Ukraine and, and Russia. And, right. you know, not like, of course, there were also fanatical Nazis in Latvia. I'm not denying that we had our own share of collaborators, you know, people who actually genuinely wanted to play by the Nazis' rule book and, and who actually murdered Jews. We have the inf infamous Arai squad as well. Arai, is that the uh, forest? Legion? No, no, no. That, that's no? that's uh, the, the forest, forest guys are constantly shocked who are like against everyone. Arai's oh. squad is one of those uh, Einsatzgruppen. Oh, okay. Yeah, we also had those. We we're not denying that, but uh, but I, well, I think what I consider important to mention is that at no point anyone here was a, at least for the most part was a fan of Nazism as as an ideology. They just you know they wanted to fight against Stalin. And right. an important important evidence to this is the fact that Latvian Legion members, the guys who volunteered for the SA units in the mm -hmm. Wehrmacht, mm -hmm. they served as guards in the Nuremberg trials. They weren't. Ah. Judge, they were literally used as guards, and they guarded the war criminals, because right. you know, if if uh, as I've spoken to to veterans, when I managed to get them, that was some years ago. I don't know. If, I don't. I do not know if they are still alive at this point. But well, like mm, they told me, not many. It was. It was because you know, if you have at that point, and also I've spoken to, because we have these studies here in Latvia, in the Baltics, and, and Estonia, and Lithuania as well where one part of your family gets conscripted into the Red Army, other part in, in, in you know the Nazi army to fight against the Reds. And that was my story as well. My, my stepfather's dad fought for the Reds. And my, my other grand, grandfather, well, uh, he was conscripted to build roads for the Germans. Hmm. He didn't shoot anyone, but he was conscripted to do that thing. Yeah. So it was just... And still, after the war, they didn't hate each other. It was because they're all Latvians at, at the end. And... Uh, Many people, even on both sides, uh, to the till the end of their days, have always told me that uh, it's not like we loved any of them. Mm. To us here in the Baltics, they both were utter monsters. But right, so you had was... to pick one. You had to pick something. You you had to pick something that you believed would be a bit more merciful towards you and your family, and figure something out later. It was. Mm. <laughs> The the option to resist everyone was a naive one for such a tiny country as Latvia or Estonia or Lithuania. You had to fight for a monster, right. one or the other one. Right. The, it was just that. It is just very brutal if you think about it these days. And then it's kind of hard to explain to the people when 
Well, you know, well, this is why we still hold these we things. here in the West who've known really, like, historically speaking, luxury since 1945. Going on from that, then, since the Soviet Union fell apart in, in the 90s, mm -hmm. how has Latvian done, Latvia fared economically? Well, it's been rough. It's been rough because, once again, a lot of our, a lot, a lot of our population is Russian. Ah. About, about 20-30%. That's because of uh, the policies that the Soviet Union did, mm -hmm. where if you would finish college, they would send you to the other end of the Soviet Union to serve, to work there for some years, maybe make a family or something. If you were conscripted into the army, then you all would also serve as far from home as humanly possible. And they Women's had a policy where, and they had a policy towards all, not just Latvia, but towards all the national republics, as they were called. You know, mm -hmm. all, all the that includes Georgia, Kazakhstan, everywhere. Yeah. They had a systematic policy where they would try to make the local people, the native people of the area, a minority in that area. They treated us very much like, um, well, I don't know. It's kind of hard to hard to put it in words, but. Basically, uh, I, I like to compare us in the Baltics here and many other people like, uh, I don't know, the First Nations people felt when the colonizers came because right. that, that that was our fate, basically. And I feel much more in common with those people because <laughs> this is our ancestral home. It's not like we went anywhere. This is where we are. Mm. This is where this is. This is our land. And we have such a we, we still have our pagan festivals and tribes and everything. And. And and we had this aspect where everything in, in Soviet Union was done in Russian, and just like in Ukraine, our language was suppressed, our traditions was suppressed, our culture was suppressed. We were second-rate citizens. There are uh, Soviet claims of equality among men, and and like all this, all this good stuff that they promised, it was nothing but a charade, nothing but a farce and a lie, because it was all you know. You either become Russians and assimilate, or 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 else. That that right. was it, and. And this is this is why you know when the Soviet Union collapsed, we still had a lot of people here who actually believed this ideology because the Russian people in the Soviet Union, they only felt the economical impact of this. They only felt the fact that we had planned economy and like hardcore socialism. Uh, and in my sense of socialism, uh, we, we, which I don't mean social democracy. Uh, I have to explain this to your American listeners, probably. I mean the kind of socialism where there's literally zero private property, where they take away, where, where they take away your cow. And, and so the, the issue was that a lot of the Russians who had, you know, lived very comfortably here and hadn't learned our language and everything, they chose not to learn our language. They didn't want to. They uh, thought at one point that uh, the Soviet Union might come back. And right. because because of various issues, including corruption and greed in Latvia and in Estonia, we did not give citizenship automatically to people to everyone who was like living here. We gave it to the by the what was this uh, the blood principle that citizenship right. was granted automatically only to those who were citizens in the in, in the first independent country and to their relatives. So it was a bit of a mess. And now we so had you to, had to be a Latvian citizen in 1939. Or, uh, or 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 a direct descendant, yes. Yeah. Okay. Now okay. it's a bit weird now, but at that point, yeah, that was probably at that point my government thought it would be a good idea because they were worried that the Soviet Union actually might return, and that was kind mm. of a preventive measure. But it turned out to be a great mistake because that has split up our society. Mm. Uh, again, like everything, it's a bit of a double-edged sword here. Yeah. But um, but. A lot of these people, when once we joined the EU, a lot of these people who, you know, because they didn't speak Latvian, they they couldn't get actual decent jobs, uh, uh, and, their, and their kids and everything. A lot of them moved to Ireland and 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 Holland. We lost a bunch of population once again due to immigration. Right. Now that now this process has stopped, but uh, you know it still still exists. But economically speaking, we we've been we we could have do better, but we're um. I'd say we're doing okay now because so uh, joining the EU has that been a positive? Yes, yes, okay. I'd say it's a positive. It's only a long-term positive because, yeah. for one, reg regulations are awful. That's the one. That's the one thing that I will give to the to the Brexit people in Britain. Regulations are terrible, and Brussels gets on your nerves a lot. 
the whole thing is that uh, we had to shift systems. We had to adapt. We had by this yeah. reconstruction period, but now we're doing okay. The biggest thing that changed was this everyday corruption. You know, back before we joined the EU, it was still pretty much normal to just you know if you if you have a speeding ticket, then you just pay like ten your ten lats at that point our currency to the cops, and you could like bribe your way out of this. Yeah, and, and the EU changed that very slowly, and right now we're trying oh. to. Kind of adapt to this. One big issue that we have here in Latvia and that I'm trying to fight against, due to the fact that I've um, I've actually spent some time, you know, abroad in a lot of places in the West. You see a lot of these mom and pop stores, you know, these little tiny mm-hmm. stores everywhere. This is not a thing in Latvia at all. Very very few oh. of so those stores exist. Everything's changed tour because we still have this um, kind of stigma, kind of this. Uh, we, I call it post Soviet mentality. The fact that if you start your own business, that's considered a bad thing. It's like oh, it's not a, okay. it's not good because the business starting your own business is still associated with um, with you know the '90s and, and the people who live there. Because well, I can speak from my generation's perspective. Again, I was born in 1989. I'm one of those one of those Atmo the kids, you know, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union kids, and uh, I can I can tell you that our parents wanted my generation to build a new capitalist democratic western society here in latvia yeah but at the same time they really wanted us to keep all the old soviet values you know the things they learned in school change things and build everything anew but don't change too much right and that's right. that's causing a lot of issues right now with a lot of our policies yeah but, but there's a lot of people who are who are doing doing things i like to consider myself among them <laughs> because of course, I've been lucky lucky to do this, but at least hey, I try to actually you know do my best here. But we're doing okay. We're doing okay. fairly well. Uh, currently, uh, the median salary in Latvia is about thirteen hundred United States dollars per or month, or about the same in euros. Uh, but also, our rent prices are ridiculously cheap. Like our oh. healthcare is okay. For example, I live in an Art Nouveau style building, 15 minutes from the city center, uh, in a three apart in a three kind of room apartment, mm-hmm. with like uh, those natural wooden floors. And it's a historical building, and I pay 450 euros plus bills per month. Okay, I'm moving there because the housing prices here are insane. The other thing, see, Latvia in general, Latvia itself is, if you imagine this, we're about twice the size of Netherlands. Right. Just- they, but we, but Netherlands has a population of like what sixteen million. This half of Latvia, and Latvia has a population of two million. Yeah, it, because of because Netherlands of all the history, really crowded. <laughs> because of all the history and everything, you know, again, uh, uh, Stalinist regime and everything. Uh, because of our low population number, uh, Latvian countryside is super ridiculously cheap. That's mm. a, kind of another effect of this situation. So, f- also half of our population lives in our capital. Right. That, again, because of all, all all the historical impacts, our property prices for real estate are just falling constantly. But yeah, I just I just wanted to pay wanted to show this that uh, again, World War II impacts still very very much felt this day because you know this last generation in the World War II who died off, they didn't make children, obviously. So that was also right. a kind of fall down, and this kind of you know repeats itself. And I hope that maybe in twenty years, thirty. We we will you know get back to our feet or, or something. Yeah, we're a tiny happen. nation and we're proud of it and we we have forests, Lot, lots of forests, rain and misery. Best thing. Forest, rain and misery. Okay, They're kind of oh, like hockey too. In the spring. Thanks for painting that picture of Latvia for us, Kristaps. Now before we go on, I think this is a good point to take a short break. So audience, please come back with us in a few minutes for the rest of my conversation with Chris Stapps Andersons of the Eastern Border Podcast. Did you know that the cappuccino was invented by a Ukrainian? Or that many first names, like Philip and Agatha, were brought to Western Europe by Ukrainian princesses? Or that a Ukrainian was the first female given the rank of officer in a modern army. Well, if you didn't, and even if you did, you can learn more about my podcast, Wandering the Edge, a podcast about Ukrainian history with a spot of travel. And all in English. 
And if you like Beyond Barbarossa as much as I do, because, well, it makes my life a whole lot easier since I don't have to do any episodes deep diving into the Eastern Front of the Second World War, please take a listen to Wandering the Edge for a deep dive into Ukrainian history, culture, and traditions. Find out more on wanderingtheedge.net. And now let's get back to Scott exploring and explaining the Eastern Front of the Second World War. Thank you, listeners, for coming back to part two of my conversation with Chris Stapps Anderson's host of the Eastern Border podcast. Chris Stapps, you've described the historical impact of the Second World War on Latvia. I want to turn now to current events in your podcast. You've spent the last 14 months, no, 15 months now, covering the invasion of Ukraine. Did you see that coming, the invasion in, in February 2022? I saw that a war would come at some point. Specific dates, no. Right. right. I can't tell you specific dates. It's not uh, a war. It's a special military operation. Yeah, there's a joke about this uh, too, by the way, uh, which Igor Girkin, my favorite nemesis, mind you, has uh, been telling recently. Uh, he says that, um, imagine this Soviet political joke. So um, in, in, a, in a huge ceremony in the Soviet, uh, like late Soviet era or whatever, they're, they're opening like a huge monument to, to Stirlitz from the 17, mo- 17 Moments of Spring. Great Soviet movie, but spies. And, and and like everything's happening very nicely and everything's awesome and the monument's being opened, but then a drone pops in and explodes. And then um, Stirlitz uh, kind of, you know, cleans off his, his, uh, his coat because he's a KGB agent who's sent in to spy on the Germans. And then he thinks to himself, hmm, war. But then, with a soft voice, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin corrects him. Ah, 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 comrade, special military operation. Yeah. It's no, it's no nonsense. It's like, it's been going on since 2014, all these right. conflicts and everything. And even before that, if you look at Transnistria, for example, and the events in Georgia, Georgia. Yeah. it's been a mess. And... Uh, it's it's been a mess, especially since I I believe it's some sort of inferiority complex of Putin himself, because for one, you know he wants to he wants to be like Stalin, but he's totally not like Stalin. Stalin did not have dachas in California, he did not have money abroad, he did not you know steal no. a bunch of money. He literally had well, no he money. He did steal money. He was a bank robber. Well, in the early days, yes, <laughs> but when he got power, Stalin simply did not need money in the Soviet Union. Well, no. Like Stalin would let you know that he wants something and it would magically appear or else. <laughs> that, that's how it operated. But he yeah. never had any Dutchess. And, and Stalin, out of all the things, this is a favorite thing of mine because I'm a bit of a bit of a nerd person. I like to compare Stalin to Hitler, for example, and now Putin as well. If, if, you, if you know Dungeons and Dragons, that game, have bit, you heard yeah. of it? The game, yeah. Well, there, there, there are like this this alignment system, which is based on law and and like law versus right. chaos and, and and good versus evil. So, so Stalin is lawful evil. He obeyed the rules and he was cold and calculating. Meanwhile, Hitler and Putin these days they were chaotic evil. Right. There is a difference, you know. Uh, yeah. that one is a, one is a chaotic force of destruction. Another one is a calculating sociopath. Does that make any of them good? Nope. But it's no, also some on the evil list. side of the ledger. Yeah, except one of them is like very cold and calculating. And you know what? I, I think that Stalin, because I, I made a series about him. Uh, at, yeah, uh, I, that's well, how I was introduced to your podcast. Yeah, yeah I, I, did, and... I didn't finish them, sadly, because oh, things, a lot of things happened with, with the war and everything. But, but I truly believe the moment when, when Stalin said that when his first wife died uh, from tuberculosis, when he wrote in his diary that, you know, all love towards humankind has gone away and the only thing that could melt his cold stone heart has now passed away. I believe that's the point where when Koba or uh, Mr. Jugashvili becomes Stalin. Now, see, Putin wants to be like that, but Putin, unlike Stalin, who always, you know, always wore, wore the same coat and, and lived, you know, he had the best stuff and he liked test people, but he never he never showed off any excesses. He, he was a man to was more more private and 
I would say Stalin had way more gravitas. Oh, sorry, not gravitas, but dignitas. The, this dignity about his position and everything. Because, you know, for example, Stalin even refused to exchange his own son for right. a lieutenant, right? He was that dedicated to this whole situation, right? Can you imagine Putin sacrificing anything he owns mm. to make the war in the Ukraine and faster? Putin's just a just a criminal, a kleptocrat, and he wants yeah. to be Stalin, and he glorifies Stalin and makes him a, to be like some sort of a good guy. But, but to be honest, if Stalin would be alive today, then Putin would be among the people who'd be put to the wall first and shot instantly. <laughs> and there, there's a, a an image that uh, cheers me greatly. Uh, that sounds awful. Um, I mean, look, look, comrade, sounding awful is okay. <laughs> but that's, that, this is this is how it is. This is how it is. This is when my tagline is happiness is mandatory. I mean, you sort of have to accept the fact that everything can be terrible, and then mm-hmm. you kind of have to figure out how to deal with it on your own. Right. right. And and, and uh, this is this is by the way a fresh hochma, uh, how we call anecdotes and the political jokes from Odessa, mind you, because all the Soviet political jokes that you know or maybe you don't know, all the ones that Reagan collected in the United States, right? They all come from one little city in Ukraine called Odessa, because that's right. where all the Ashkenazi Jews live. And right. they have a brand new one. And this is about Radio Yerevan. Radio Yerevan used to be a comedy radio show in the Soviet Union, it has nothing to do with Armenia. It, was, it ran in Moscow and in all the big cities. But it was called Radio Yerevan, and they were sent in listener questions. So the traditional joke format is about Radio, Ye- Radio Yerevan or Armenian oh, radio. Okay, okay. But Radio Yerevan gets asked, what's the difference between Putin and Hitler? Radio Yerevan answers, Hitler did not call Jews a brotherly nation. <laughs> okay. It's it's dark, isn't it? It's really dark. It's really, yes. <laughs> but uh, that, that's, that's the sort of thing. This is this is the, the attitude. So, sorry about in, interjecting this, but like I said, it's a it's a way how I deal with all the stress, you know, mm-hmm. because I've lost ten people in this war, for example, mm-hmm. so far that I know personally, yeah. and the Soviet was traumatic. That. And this is this is a way how it might seem silly to some people, but people ask. I also have talked about my podcast. People have told me that you should be more professional. But the problem is that if I do that, then I'll just you know go insane or something. I, I can't be the very cold, impassionate journalist. I kind of have to be the gonzo person here because I lived through this whole this situation. Yeah, really? I I am in, inside it. I am as much as a participant as I am an observer. Therefore, I cannot simply remain on the sidelines. And and this is why my show <laughs> might not a- appeal to everyone who, you know, goes to goes to it and expects a very academical analysis of, of the recent most recent events. But that's a way of coping with everything, to be honest, because yeah. it's, it's something that they should do. And mm-hmm. this is why I also kind of want to tell these jokes, because it makes it also these jokes tell a lot about the whole Soviet society as a whole. Right. For example, the, the most favorite joke that I told to Americans, and maybe you guys will like it too, is um, is this one. This is the, the, the most top rated Soviet joke that I, I've heard from American perspective. So in the, in the height of the Cold War, uh, Nixon, Nixon and, and Brezhnev, they're, they're walking uh, next to Niagara Falls. And they're, of course, they're arguing about everything, you know, whose country is better and everything like that. And at one point, they start to argue about who has the best bodyguard. And they decide to test it. So Nixon turns to his bodyguard and orders him to, you know, to just jump off into Niagara Falls. And, and the American bodyguard looks at Nixon and says, well, Mr. President, I, I, I can't do that. I, I have family and, and friends and, and loved ones. Then you know they understand the message. Everything's fine, and then Brezhnev turns to his bodyguard and says, "You, you there, comrade, jump!" And without hesitation, the Soviet bodyguard instantly just runs and starts jumping. And he's pulled off at the last moment, like the last second. And and confused Nixon is just asking him, "Well, well, well, well why did you do that? This, this is madness." And the Soviet bodyguard turns to Nixon and says, "Well, Mister American President, I too have loved ones and family and friends." That that is dark. That's very dark. <laughs> that is that is dark. But that, that's that's the that's the thing. This is why happiness is mandatory. All of our jokes are this way. Uh, this is kind of uh, the thing. We, we um, it's a cultural thing, I suppose. We've grown up to this situation because you know when 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 you're as I was growing up in the '90s with mass crime and poverty everywhere. 
life was dark already so we just kind of mm. made fun of it that was that was it it's not yeah. like we try to shock people with it or anything for us it's just that it's it's sort of the normal thing you talked about the differences between 19 um the second world war and and the current situation but do you see any similarities between what's going on now in ukraine and what happened in between 1941 and 44 in ukraine mm. ah that's that's a good question and i do i do not mean it in the way the politicians mean it i mean it honestly the thing is the russians think it's 1942 for them you know they're fighting mm. the battle of stalingrad at least putin likes to put it that way but they're actually fighting as uh battle of tsusima in 1905 oh that's how i view it i think it's another russo japanese war to be honest except in place of japanese there are ukrainians if you look at this the same that's way i mean I, if if you look at this uh, the whole propaganda is the same the the evil enemy that is also you know weak and miserable natural russian lands all this stuff except uh, except at that point in the japanese russo japanese war there was also a racial aspect but it's also like popping up about you know yeah. how russians call ukrainians hohols <laughs> the biggest issue was the fact that um yeah they lost that one <laughs> And and the mm. fact that how it's been moving into like even the Gitkin says it's it's turned into a positional war because when I was on the front lines myself, you see, tanks don't move anywhere because they're too afraid of man pads. Tanks right. have their role to play, and it's better to have a tank than not than not to have one. But tanks are all covered and hidden and sitting in, in, in the trenches themselves, and they are afraid to do some drastic maneuvers like in World War II. The it's Russian a positional tanks. war. Yeah, Ukrainian tanks as well, you know, oh, okay. same thing, unless they make a breakthrough with more modern tanks, because one advantage that, for example, the uh, Abrams tanks and Le Leopard tanks have over the T-90s is the fact that uh, Le Leopards and Abrams tanks can actually fire precisely while moving. It's the fire control system that grants it the ultimate advantage. Oh, oh and th that an extra, extra about one and a half kilometers of range, too. It's just that the T-90 tank can theoretically shoot while moving, except it can't, can't do it with any real accuracy. Mm. Abrams and Leopards can. It's, it's a thing. The thing is all about training. It's all about quantity and all this stuff. But it's a, it's a very weird war to the sense that you still need tanks for breakthroughs. You still have to risk yes. them and put them through. But... It, it has stopped being a mobile warfare war mm -hmm. in general because from the Russian perspective, at least, they have shown their complete inability to do any combined arms tactics since mm -hmm. they are focused on similar situation. Like like I wrote about in the article with, with Prigozhin and, and Wagner Group, they continuously do the same World War II tactics. They right. still think it's World War II, these so-called meat assaults, as they name it, right? Yeah. And uh, it's but this is the era of the combined warfare, so it all depends. All, all rise all, like Ukrainian success currently depends on whether or not they will learn how to pull off proper combined arms assaults against fortified positions. Because what happened in, in the Kharkiv Oblast mm -hmm. that was a counteroffensive, and that was also planned, obviously, but that was a way easier thing than to do the same against very fortified positions. Two different animals completely yes so it's you know as a historian of course i like historical parallels but at this point it's currently the conflict is calcified just like the western front did in world war one mm -hmm. and and bakhmut is kind of like stalingrad because it, it doesn't exist at this point even it's smaller well smaller of, of course but you know if i had to put pal parallels somewhere you yeah. know yeah it's just that from from my perspective, there are way more parallels with other military conflicts than with World War II currently. Ah, okay. Although okay. although Russia would definitely like to, and they continuously do, by the way, portray this as another great patriotic war. Except yes. then you have to ask the question of, uh, okay, then, but you know, who who attacked whom and why? Because the whole idea that Ukraine, a nation without nuclear weapons, which they had given up voluntarily for protection of United States and Russia. In 1994, with the Budapest memorandums, you know, I, I cannot imagine a non-nuclear state with like about one third of the population of Russia actually attacking Russia. How does this even make sense? Mm -hmm. And secondly, secondly, they also claim that NATO was planning to attack Russia. Now, look, look, look. I'm, I'm, I'm I might, I might not be, you know, a, a military expert to such a degree, 
I have learned some things during this war, obviously, but but if I was a general and if I wanted to attack Russia as a you know a part of NATO kind of process or something, then I would do this like two two months ago or something. Like if, if NATO would want to attack Russia, they would have done it already. Because mm. what are, this is the moment if if anyone wants to attack Russia, this is the moment when to do it. Yes. So again, this is just objectively proven to be false. So I don't know. It's it's kind of like they play on these myths of World War II to themselves, but in earnest, it just kind of turns into a farce, you know. It's, it's the yeah. same situation that you know history repeats itself. And once is a tragedy, once is a farce. And and for example, when when Igor Girkin opened a, a, a subsidiary of his Angry Patriots Club, which by the way is my trademark in European Union because I managed to steal it from him and patent it. Uh, yes. Well done. <laughs> uh, but basically, he opened a, a a kind of a subsidiary of these Angry Patriots in Saint Petersburg. Oh. And over there, they had national Bolsheviks on the scene with armbands and everything. And the only difference between the Nazi logo and the national Bolshevik logo is that Nazis had a swastika. National Bolsheviks have exactly the same everything else, except they have hand grenade and lightning. Oh, That's that it. one. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I've seen that. And then right. it's kind of like, it's kind of funny to look at, you know, people in brown shirts wearing red armbands that totally do not resemble anything, you know, and then they claim that they are the ones who are fighting against the Nazis in Ukraine, right? Yes. Yeah, it's just that it's it's a bit insane. And sorry about the random tangents. It's just that you're asking yeah. me questions that, that make me think a bit, and and I can't I, I can't give you simple answers because this war welcome. is not a simple affair. <laughs> this is why I do my show. I just want to explain all this stuff to the West. I think that you know you should know you should know right. and you should understand. Well, that because- it nicely leads me into my next question: is what is the one lesson um, that the West or the English speaking world doesn't understand about the Second World War in the Baltic area. Oh, okay. Second World War. In World War II, that thing, yeah, one thing that I really, is, a, which is why I haven't had an episode on my own show about the situation is the whole fact about how we, the Baltics, were actually, how it really did see Hitler as liberator for a period. Mm-hmm. And the very fact that we started this conversation with, I still don't know how to make an episode about the Latvian legionnaires who, yes, volunteered in Hitler's army to fight against Stalin and not get cancelled instantly. Right. Because that's a big issue. And this is why I mentioned the Nuremberg trials and, and all the complexity that is, that, is, that is in there. Because it's it's a thing. It's it's kind of like the West tries to forget oftentimes that, um, you know, it's always, it's always nice to be on the side of the good guys and then the good guys won. Right. But then there's this Stalin figure over there you know, your ally and everything. And then people also tried to forget that, you know, Stalin was allied to Hitler in the early war and they mm-hmm. actually held a military parade in, in Poland together and all this stuff. And, and for for unknown reasons, winter war against Finland is somehow not included in the World War II. No, which also I had to really, bizarre. yeah, I, I did a uh, three episodes on the winter war and, um, oh, wait, wait, I, I have, a, I have, a, I have a beer here. I'll, I'll quickly open it. Mm. Uh, here's the one to Simo Hauha. Simo, uh, I'll salute with my coffee. Excellent. To uh, Simo. Like, to, to Simo is, uh, if you don't know who Simo is, please leave oh, yeah. it up. But there's a thing. There's a thing. It's like, kind of like I feel personally, and this the, is an the emotional biggest, level. The greatest um, uh, sniper, just for the listeners to remind them. Yeah. Uh, Simo is a, a Finnish uh, fighter, um, warrior, and the greatest sniper of the war, if not of all time. Uh, I, yeah, he was, and he did he did everything without even an optical scope. Just no, didn't like the optical scope, and he thought it would, uh, you know, the reflection uh, off the the glass yeah, lens would, would give him away. We we get we get taught this in school because you know it kind of resembles all the all of our region if you think about it. He was a very humble man, very short, very really short farmer, never really showed any kind of ambitions, and was a very polite man. Uh, up until his death in uh, age 92, by the way. And uh, yeah, he was just a humble little man. And when he was asked, you know, how how he did so well, he said, well, you know, I was just doing what I was told and I did my best. Mm-hmm. Very humble and, and kind of inspiring person for all of us here in Eastern Europe. But the thing is that, yeah, this is the attitude that we kind of don't like. The fact that me as Latvian uh, and everyone in the Baltics, we're always put into this defensive position, you know. The fact that there is this one... One narrative, which has been written about like all the time, and even after the World War II, not like anyone likes Stalin. It's just that I, 
it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to go on and 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 understand that you know there there are more complexities to this especially when it comes to my region because again yeah. Hitler, uh, Stalin came first and murdered a lot of people right and then it's like is the fact that I I I would like to stop apologizing for all these facts and 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 you know I I'm, I just don't like to worry all the time constantly about the fact that if I make an episode on this that I'll get instantly cancelled because someone's definitely gonna yell at me for for defending Nazism or something which is right. definitely not the case absolutely not the case right. that's the thing that's the thing by the way um in the World War Two our Latvian Legion the guys who were uh, these Latvian volunteers and and conscripts too because it was both ways they didn't they surrendered after Hitler had died. They, wow. they, the Kurland pocket held on like one of the very mm-hmm. last places where fighting happened, and it happened for one single reason, so that as many people as humanly possible could escape to the West and surrender right. to the Allies. They did not even hope for anything at that point. They just had seen how horrible the Soviets were, and all they did was just hold the line for as long as possible against the Soviet Union, so that as many people could take their little fishing boats, go to Gotland, and from there travel somewhere else, and maybe have a chance of escaping the horrid Stalin, Stalinist regime. Mm-hmm. And, that, and, and they did it way past beyond when there was a lost cause. Now, you got you to gotta think with how, how horrid Stalin was to us for people to do this sacrifice. This is why we honor them. Not because they fought for Hitler, which is how the Russian side tries to portrait, but because of this very fact that this fact alone proves that they didn't, didn't care about the ideology they cared about, you know, trying to preserve as many Latvians as possible. And the same has to be said about people who fought for the Reds, because they too, right. as far as I've spoken with them, they also fought to preserve as many Latvians as they could. Mm-hmm. And we have a lot of studies about the situation, and just that, as I quoted at the beginning, war walked all over us twice, and and it was a humongous tragedy, and, and we are, in a way, as Timothy Snyder put it, bloodland. It is, it is what it is, and this is why we have our gallows humor, and this is why we are um, sometimes less professional and, and stuff. But you know, it's it's a thing that, that we just do. This is this is it's, how we cope. Yeah, it's a different style. Well, thanks. Yeah, I think that that answers all all my questions, and I think yeah, it's that's some of what I try to get across both of my podcasts and in my books about uh, the, the second world war in Ukraine is that it was extremely complex, um, you know, and the Hollywood version where it's good guys versus bad guys, it just doesn't uh, give you the understanding. That yeah, I, mean, I mean, I mean, that works say in France or in the, the battle for mm. Britain air battles there, you can see like Nazis versus these people, but, but not in Eastern Europe. It's yeah. because of the weirdness of everything. Yeah. Well, it's, just, it's rate, just so complex. At any rate, I, I wanted to say a special thank you for inviting me over to the show. Oh, well, thank, uh, thank <laughs> you for coming on, Christoph. Of course. A... For my final words, i just like to say to everyone, um, comrades, of course, remember, happiness is mandatory. Thank you very much, Christaps. That, again, was Christaps Andersons the researcher, writer, and host of the Eastern Border Podcast, which you can find on all your favorite podcasting apps, or find it on the web at easternborder.lv. Remember to like and follow his podcast. It's really informative. And remember to like and follow Beyond Barbarossa, this very podcast you're listening to right now. It's the only podcast in English about the Eastern Front of the Second World War. And like the Eastern Border, it's available on all podcasting apps. I'd also really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever you listen. It really helps spread the word to others interested in history. If you have any other comments or suggestions or questions or anything at all to add, just drop me a line at, uh, but you can send an email to contact at beyondbarbarossa.ca or through the Facebook Beyond Barbarossa page. You can also find me, Scott Burry Author, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I want to thank you again for listening and special thanks to all who have supported the podcast through Patreon. Remember, until all Ukrainian refugees can return home safely, 
Your financial support goes to charities that help Ukrainian refugees. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, this episode marks the first anniversary of this podcast. And we've been coming out most of the time regularly every two weeks. So after a year of doing this, 29 episodes plus bonus episodes, I'm going to take a short break. So look for the next episode, the first episode of season two of Beyond Barbarossa in four weeks time. So that'll be toward the end of July. I don't have a calendar in front of me right now. But if you follow the podcast on your preferred app, you'll get the notice when it goes live. And of course, you can always follow me on social media. I'm going to be posting uh, lots of advance notice about when you can expect to see Season 2, Episode 1. And that's when I'll be taking a look at Case Blue, how it unfolded through the summer of 1942, leading up to the notorious Battle of Stalingrad. So enjoy your summer, everyone. Until next time, I remain your podcaster, Scott Burry. Till then, keep your paddles in the water. Slava Ukraina.